In this video, after taking down the mast last time, I start getting bits back to the UK and start buying bits of aluminium, making up all the attachment points for the rigging at the top of the mast, and uh, drill a load of holes in some tube. It's all in preparation for taking it all back to the U back to France. So this is another video in the long running saga of how I turned this into a boat. I bought the tube from a second-hand tube supplier and got it delivered to a barn on the top of a hill and people started calling me Noah. Did it make sense? Was it a logical thing to do? I don't know. But here I am several years later and the boat's looking really good and it's getting close to the point where I can do that trip I've always wanted to do. Now in the standard YouTube mantra, please like, comment, share, subscribe if you like this video. So I decided that the new mast would have aluminium steps welded in instead of the old galvanised British telecom um, mast steps from a sort of telegraph pole on. The first thing here was to get a straight line down the pole and start drilling holes and then I could start making the steps. I want to make sure that all the mast steps line up properly all the way down. It's quite difficult to draw a straight line on a tube. Um, so one of the techniques I'm using to make sure I get them done right is I've made up this piece of paper, curled it around the whole thing, folded it in half to make the dot, and then when you go around like this and you pop it all the way around, you know, and turn it around, you know that the halfway line that's now on the other side is exactly halfway from there. You can also work it out with 2 pi r, but there's always a little bit of variation, so it's best just to use a bit of paper, really, um, because then you, you've sense-checked it as well. So I'm just doing this, but I'm using a laser as well to make sure they're all in line, this first line. So I think I've got this all in line. So these are one of the steps that I've made. Um, obviously, it's not sanded up and nice and flush yet but I've got a thin bit of three quarter tube, this ladder rung material, which is really cool. That's your anti-slip. And then some eight millimeter by 30 plate that I've welded on the end. And that will be the step that goes all the way through. So one hole is inch and the other hole is three quarter inch. And that way I haven't drilled too much out of the actual mass material. So this one here is 25, the other one's 25 millimeter inch, and the other one's 19 millimeter three quarters. And it just sits nicely in there, and it's really, really, really strong. And then what I'll do is I'll just weld around there on both sides, and it's done. And there won't be too much heat affected zone weakening the aluminium, because it really is just a sealing weld, because, because two, they both slot into the holes, the weld is literally just to seal it up and keep it in place. So I'll put as minimal heat in as I can get away with while still getting the weld wetted properly. And then that'll be good. All right, so this is my little step making production factory here. Trying to get everything ready. We got the welder over there. I think they um, supplied too much gas in that bottle, over pressurized it, which is great because it means I've got more gas. So here's some of the steps I've already made and the other bits and pieces. I'm wearing this mask now all the time, welding aluminium. Uh, it's a FPP3 or whatever you call it mask. Just helps keep the fumes away from me. My foot pedals down there. Nice little seat made out of my pipe bender. That's comfortable, not. So I was welding this one up and you can see there that I've got a blow through. It's that little hole there. Um, and that's because it's two tubes welded together. And there's a very small gap in between. And um, where I got here and overheated it slightly, the air inside pushed out through that hole and made a big mess. So I've got to redo that one today. That has, that's the first time that's, or second time that's happened. Um, so generally it welds up quite nice around there. And then we weld up this end. And generally I get away with it and what I'm doing now is I'm going to drill a hole all the way through um, because when I weld these into the mast and I put my final plug in here it blows out a hole each time um, through the weld 
and you can't weld it up because every time you start to weld it overheats the air in this gas in this tube and like pushes it and makes like a little chimney through your weld so to stop that from happening I'm just welding a little uh, drilling a little hole on the down bit that's going to be inside the tube inside the mask tube so you won't see it anyway but yeah it's all good fun trying to weld this lot up so it's in my little seat area I've got my gas lens on now because I'm trying that out so this is one of my steps and I have to make 23 of these and then another two double steps. Yeah. This plate I've got to weld on the end here like this. So one of the keys to welding up aluminium um, successfully is to really give it a good clean because you're trying to clean off basically a thin skim of aluminium oxide that forms on the surface of aluminium naturally. That's got a different melting temperature to the aluminium underneath. So um, you want to get most of it off with a bit of sandpaper um, or scotch Brite's best because you don't really want bits of dirt in the aluminium from the sandpaper. Um, also a wire brush, a stainless steel wire brush is good for that. Anyhow, so with that done, yeah, it's it's quite a task to weld up so many steps. And I I found that aluminium welding has been quite easy to get used to. I've actually found TIG stainless a little bit more difficult not quite sure why that is, but I, I've got a feeling it's because the aluminium um, has a different sort of surface tension in the weld. So you start welding and you pop in your, 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 your rod and it just seems to sort of form into a real nice shape quite quickly. Um, and I, I don't know, I've just found it a lot easier. Um, it is quite key though to get the temperatures right because you mustn't overheat it, otherwise you'll expand what's called the heat affected zone. A has area around the weld which is basically an area that's weakened because the aluminium i'm using for instance is 6082t6 so it's got a temper a hardening of t6 on it and when you weld it it basically loses that hardening um, it does regain it a little bit in time um, but generally with aluminium welding always weakens it slightly which becomes a problem as you'll see for me a bit later on in this video so I'm using 170 amps on this, uh, 5356 wire I think it is. So the intense buzzing noise is because to weld aluminium the TIG has to be capable of using AC current. And what happens is on part of the AC wave it like melts into the aluminium and then the next bit it sort of pulls off the aluminium, the dirt and contamination. So then I realised something. The heat affected zone that has around the world, at being about 25 millimeters for MIG or 30 millimeters for TIG, was just making me quite worried that I'd weakened the tube a little bit too much. I mean, this is thick tube and I hadn't put much welding in, but I went for a whole sort of series of concerns, worries, calculations. And then I decided that at the top of the mast, the top five meters, because that's the bit that's most prone to being twisted and pulled around, I decided what I was going to do is I was going to rivet in the steps, the old mast steps on that top five meters and weld in the aluminium steps up to that top five meters. So I've got 10 meters basically of aluminium steps and then five meters of um, the original riveted in steps because the riveted in steps don't weaken the mast at all really I mean very small holes and that's it so this unfortunately turned out to about be about a 300 pound mistake because what I did is I went and bought two new five meter tubes um, so I could really do the extensions properly but this is the thing about doing one-off projects you will occasionally make mistakes you will occasionally waste a little bit of your budget you know, obviously, if you do lots and lots of design and you really spend lots of times on things, then you can almost build it right once. But the reality is, is that if you're doing a one off project, you're usually going to have a few cases where you just have to do things again. And don't believe those people on forums or those keyboard warriors who tell you, oh, you know, I did this and I did that, I'm perfect. No, they're not. They're just talking rubbish, basically. 
if you want a typical examples, you've only got to look at military stuff, for example, like aircraft carriers that were a bit too short or, you know, or boats like the USS Independence and Freedom classes that have been scrapped after a very short period of time. You know, you push the edge of design or you push or you do a one off project that pushes your own skills. Mistakes will happen. And then it's how you bounce back from those mistakes and how you manage them that determines whether you're a success or not. Not the fact that you made mistakes. That's got nothing to do with the successful outcome of a project, really. So it is now time to cut apart my old friend, the mast top. And I hate doing this type of job, but sometimes you have to destroy in order to create. Um, so I'm reusing the top of the mast there, the bit with the navigation light on. Um, and I'll be welding all of this onto the top of the two new five meter poles. I'll be putting an internal sleeve in to add strength back to what essentially we are heat affected zone. So it will be stronger than the surrounding aluminium. Also the rigging attachment points that are gonna go through the top of that mast section there are gonna be stainless steel. It's gonna be one piece of stainless steel so that the rear the rear wires are attached directly through onto the front wires with no joints. And that just strikes me as being a much more solid, strong design. And it was a little bit lighter to do it that way as well, which is good. Because obviously you want to reduce the weight on the top of the mast because you really don't want it to be top heavy. Um, she's a trimaran. She's exceptionally stable. But unfortunately, trimarans are very stable upside down and very stable right way up. So you want to try and avoid that tipping point. So this is the very top of the mast here. And um, just working on the last bits on it actually. So these are my mounting points here and here for the foresail. So this is the furling system and then the very foresail um, forestay. So I'm just putting in this plate here, just tacked it in. Now I'm going to take this plate off and weld it off, off of here and just tick it all up nicely and tidy and then all I've got to do on this really is just sand down these points um, do my little nav light mount just pop rivet it on there I think we'll do these are the, the holes for the cables to go through and that should be good and then all I've got to do is just drill the, the various u-bolt holes that go around this plate to hold it all in and then there's the big M10 shouldered bolt that I'm going to stick in there that sort of holds all of this you know well, all of these bolts hold it together that's like the kingpin bolt I might do it in M12 I'm not sure but um, I think there's enough strength in all of them it's going to be about 10 bolts on that I think U-bolts mainly yeah it should do so I'm holding these little cross beams in here on the U-bolts um, just using a little bit of six millimeter I'm just going to weld around there once it's off there I'm going to take it off to weld um, and it's just so when the uh, blocks sit on here they sort of stop at that point and don't drop down onto the plate here because then if they drop down onto the plate the block here with the rope around it is going to run into there and the rope will rub on this section here and wear away whereas with that there it will keep it off so it hangs flat and it will give it that clearance that I need. Next it's time to do some painting in preparation for the steps. I use some etch primer and then Jot and Jotomastic on these. Right, I'm just using uh, Scotch Bright. This is like a really harsh stainless steel one and slightly softer Scotch Bright to turn this very shiny, nice Jotun and nice shiny pop rivet into this so a slightly scuffed pop rivet none shiny Jotun because what I've got to do now is I've got to put a little coat of Jotun or two coats of Jotun over the top of all this to cover up the sicker flex and just make sure this had four coats and uh, is really good for well I'm going to put a top coat of um, something like smooth right silver on it and then with that on it um, it should be good for many many years a quick point I'll just say about these steps is they came off after about 25 years on the mast. I'd riveted them on with um, stainless steel pop rivets using Sikaflex and Jotun again as the base. And there was no degradation after 25 years. So I'm completely happy with putting these back on again. Uh, they're tried and tested basically. 
Right, so it's now time to paint some last steps. So what I've done, I've sanded them, I've used a bit of scotch bright. Um, the 3M scotch bright I used for the, the grey stuff is, uh, oh crap. The 3M scotch bright stuff that I used for the grey, uh, the, the grey bit that I used seemed to be really harsh actually, which is quite good because I really wanted to get a bit of a, a scuffing on the pop rivets because Jotun will stick. But obviously, if it's slightly scuffed up and got a nice key in there, um, it will stick much better. So this is my joke, and it's still in date, just. Um, I need a paint stirrer, don't I? Oh, poop. Where's a paint stirrer? Obviously, I've got half a fold Model T in bits, so I've got everything else all in bits, and it's... I always give it a really, really good stir to make sure those heavy compounds are all mixed properly in. So anyhow, because I only want a very, very small amount of paint, can you believe I'm wearing my, one of my best jumpers? One of my only good jumpers. Everything else has got welding holes or paint in it. Um, but because I only want a very small amount of paint, I'm gonna use this medicine spoon. I really don't wanna, you know, you really wanna get these mixes just about spot on, so that's about top. If you've got a really good accurate set of scales, you can also do mixing by weight, which is probably better. Now today I'm using summer grade, so I've had to wait for the weather to warm up a little bit, because Jotun, you can use winter grade, and the winter grade's good to turn to, uh, well, certainly zero degrees. You can actually, that's it, apply epoxy on in zero degrees, that's substrate temperature. Not necessarily air temperature, of course. That's three of those, so I need just a half. Not so easy to calculate, that's about an half. So that's three and a half of those, and then it's gonna be one of these. By using a medicine spoon, it just means that I'm gonna get a pretty accurate mix, because the problem is, is when you start getting down to very small mixes like this, you can easily end up getting the mix wrong. I'm not sure how fussy, um, Jotun is actually, you know, if you do four to one or three to one by mistake, but on small amounts like this, I mean, obviously you're down to a sort of like, you know, it's very difficult to get the quantity right. Last step at last. So a bit of an irritating start to the master rebuild project back in the UK, but um, the work has begun and now it's just a question of carrying on rebuilding the top of the mast and then popping everything on the car and taking it all to France to hopefully get my boat back into being a sailing boat again. Thanks for watching.